Donald Trump thrives on continually shocking people. He does it so much that you can get numb to it. On the one hand, it's like, oh, yeah, it's Trump. What do you expect from him? On the other hand, I don't think we should lose our capacity to be shocked. And what happened this weekend was truly shocking, even by Trump standards. The former president of the United States stood on a stage and glorified domestic terrorists. He made a song with the so-called J6 prison choir. Yes, that is a real thing. Actual January the 6th insurrectionists in prison singing together. Trump played that song, which you are hearing right now, at the beginning of his rally. And to top it all off, he did all this on a stage in Waco, Texas. Yes, the site of that deadly standoff between law enforcement and a heavily armed cult group 30 years ago. It remains a powerful symbol of government overreach for right-wing extremists even today. But of course, Trump's fans in the crowd, they lapped it all up on Saturday. New York Times opinion columnist Charles Blow saw the reaction for himself in Waco this weekend and writes that, quote, this is part of what makes Trump so dangerous. For some, the extreme fandom creates community. For others, Trump worship could inspire violent fanaticism, as we saw on January the 6th, 2021. Joining me now is New York Times columnist Charles Blow. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. Today, Charles, on Fox, Brian Kilmeade had some harsh words for Trump's use of the January 6th rioters as a campaign opener. Have a listen. The former president of the United States opened up with January 6th video, which is insane. He should be running from that period. I don't care his point of view. That is not a good thing for him. I thought that was absolutely awful. Even though he is winning in the polls, that will not help. Now, Charles, we know a lot of Fox hosts are, you know, leaning towards the DeSantis camp and there's a kind of self-serving uh, nature to these kind of criticisms. But it's still, even a Fox host think you went too far. You probably went too far. Yes, but, you know, I think Trump is operating on multiple levels here. On, you know, legally, it's dumb. Uh, morally, it's repugnant. For his, the people who like him, though, this is part of the thing, you know, the whole catch me if you can, bro rabbit thing. The more times he is, it looks like he's trapped and he gets some, find some way to wiggle his way out of it, it actually adds to the legend of Trump. And so for him to lean into the thing that he is being pursued about for that audience actually is on brand for him. Yeah, it's a very good point. And Charles, you also write in your piece, quote, after Trump's speech, I went back to listen to his first speech after announcing his candidacy in 2015. The tone and themes were strikingly similar. He hasn't grown much personally or politically since then. He's more sure of himself and more vulgar, but narcissism is still his engine. Ultimately, if his legal issues don't do him in, his inability to grow beyond nostalgia and negativity could. And I, and I agree with a lot of that, but I also think, and I, I want to get your take here, when you look at Trump in 2015, 2016, and even look at him in 2020, he's playing footsie with a lot of the extremists now that he's openly in bed with. You know, he was playing footsie with QAnon in 2020. Now he's openly QAnon. He was kind of playing footsie with Holocaust deniers. Now he has Holocaust deniers over for dinner. So he has ramped it up even since leaving the office. Yeah, I think that that is true. However, the, the, the difference between 2016 uh, and now, is the, you know, the, the appetite in the country is different. Uh, we were pre-pandemic. Yes. We were right. Uh, you know, you know, we were before the height of Black Lives Matter. We were we were coming out of Obama. People were looking for something different, some contrast to Obama in some ways. You know, all those things were true. And he was novel at the time. You know, this this guy breaking into. Uh, the big time into playing politics, and he's a comedian in a way, he's an entertainer in a way. There's a novelty to it in 2016 that simply yes. did not exist in 2020 and certainly does not exist in 2024. That's a very good point. Um, I always think to myself, the 2016 Trump voters, I give them the benefit of the doubt at the very minimum. You know, they thought, oh, give him a chance. He, you know, oh, just try him out. It's the 2020 voters who voted for him again after watching four years of those car crashes that I will never understand. Let me ask you this, Charles. If John, I have to ask, if John Kerry had stood on a stage in 2004 and glorified the 9-11 hijackers, or even better, if Barack Obama had stood on a stage with a bunch of black convicted criminals and sung a song in 2008, how would the GOP, how would conservatives in this country have responded? 
I think Trump's base measures him by a different standard. It's not about the, the, the standard of a conventional politician. They look at him as an entertainer. They look at him as something of a wry comedian. And whether it, we may think of that comedy as puerile and vulgar, it may be dripping in racism and sexism and misogyny. But for them, that is precisely what they like. And with it, like with any other comedian, they don't necessarily have to abide by the truth. They can just stretch it as long as it's funny and entertaining. It works. Uh, they don't have to abide by kind of conventional rules of decorum as long as it works and it's funny and it's entertaining. There's a lot of people, and I don't think we, we kind of capture this enough, who are simply entertained by the man. And they yeah. love the fact added to the entertainment that quotient that he also has the power to advocate and fight for causes that they like. I mean, we all know that if he had not hosted The Apprentice, he would not have been president of the United States. There's an inextricable link between those two things. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, you mentioned entertaining. You mentioned his ability to entertain, which is undeniable. Is that the reason why Ron DeSantis is failing to make a dent uh, in the Trump lead? In fact, is going down in the polls because DeSantis just doesn't have the ability to entertain. He has no charisma whatsoever. He's a very wooden politician and performer, as we saw last week, even taking softballs from Piers Morgan. Uh, he gets battered for, you know, having U-turns on Ukraine in a way that Donald Trump doesn't. He's held to a different standard. Is that DeSantis' biggest problem, do you think? Well, there, there is the circling of the wagons around Trump whenever he gets in trouble. That happens with his base, and so I think that part of that is showing up in the polls. But in addition, there is the thing that you're talking about. DeSantis is not an entertainer, so you can't be judged by that standard. So he's judged by the conventional politician standard, and he's a horrible politician. And so there's yes. no part of him that actually shines. And and when that when that doesn't happen, he cannot get ahead. And also, he refuses to engage Trump directly, even though Trump continues to engage him directly. So it, for that base, it looks like someone who is a fighter up against someone who is not a fighter. Someone who's not a fighter and also someone who seems like they have a glass jaw. I, for one, will get my popcorn ready for any Trump DeSantis uh, presidential primary debate on stage. That one I will not miss, I'll tell you that. Charles Blow, appreciate your reporting from Waker. Appreciate your column. Appreciate you. Thank you for your time tonight.